you know what? Let's start and we're going to do a little round table and you'll get to see who is everybody. And by the way, just to let you know, it's today evening and there's tomorrow. It's the same workshop tomorrow. In fact, well, not even workshop, the same après cours tomorrow at 11.45 to 1. So I know some teachers may come today. I know we left it open as like a come in and, you know, it's at your leisure because it's, it's supposed to be like a, just a, just a, a point of, uh, you know, a gathering point for teachers to meet and exchange and to have exactly this conversation that we're having with you, Teresa. So, all right. So I'm so excited to present to you our first après cours in math. Welcome, everybody. I'm so happy to see all of you. Um, well, that's it. So it's our, our first après cours. And of course, um, our purpose is here mainly just to get teachers from across the province. And I know our first après cours has to be like a little bit of, a, of an introduction just to uh, get everybody uh, set up. But hopefully in the ones coming, it'll be even less formal. All right. Um, so I wanted to start off by presenting Helen, uh, who's going to be the co-host or maybe the main host today. And um, and uh, I don't know, Helen, you want to introduce yourself before I? Uh, sure, I can. So uh, I've been teaching now probably about a decade. Um, I've done math and science, predominantly the high stuff. Uh, I've done it in individualized settings, and I've never done teacher-led math, not since I was youth sector a million years ago. Uh, but so I do have some experience in both of those. And although this semester, I'm only actually teaching uh, physics because I'm, I'm also working for the union, but uh, I still talk to all my staff and see them and listen to what they say and have helped write placement tests and whatnot, so. Okay, one, well, <laughs> but, but let's not forget, Helen taught everything almost under the sun. So her yeah. expertise and all of them, and everything is like, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. So we're lucky to have her. Um, in term, uh, I, I'll present myself. Uh, my name is Micheline Amar. I'm also a math and science teacher. And uh, right now it's, I've been only in this post for the past year and a half, which is like uh, the, um, the, CP, like a pedagogical consultant uh, implementation of the new program. Um, so prior to that life, prior to this life, I actually taught for over 15 years, all levels of math, all levels of science, except chemistry and biology. But, um, you know, everything else uh, I'm, I'm okay in. And of course, uh, let's do a round table uh, around the block, let's see. I see wonderful teachers here. So let's start with you, Teresa, where you're from. Hi, I work in Cowansville at the um, Brome Missisquoi campus and I'm teaching currently, we don't have a lot of science students, but we have right now we have a chemistry student and then I'm teaching all levels of math and, um, um, and also computers and, some other little things, so, and but I've been around a long time. <laughs> <laughs> we don't like to uh, date ourselves. <laughs> well, nice to have you, Teresa. Thank you, thank you. And I think Carla. Hello. Uh, yes, I'm Carla. I um, I'm new to the Nova Career Center in uh, Chattagay. Um, before that, I was in the youth sector in Gaspe um, for Eastern Shore School Board. So I taught in Gaspe for 14 years, a variety of science and math, pretty much every level <laughs> of both. Um, and now at Nova, I have kind of a mixed bag. I am um, partially replacing someone who is on um, a progressive retirement to teach the um, advanced math sec four or five as well as the advanced science sec four and chemistry and physics and on the days that i'm not replacing that person i'm doing math resource so that could be the grade not anybody in in adult ed or any level mostly math is where i try to pick up the slack um, so it could be grade nine it could be the grade 10 cst 
Sometimes it can be an auto mechanic student or a welding student that's having an issue with a math concept that they need for their vocation. Just depends that every day is different when I'm in the resource center. That's awesome. Oh, you're, you're the jack of all trades. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's got to do with science and math. <laughs> Well, that's where we were here. <laughs> and our last friend, I'm sorry, your name is Richard? Richard? Um, my name, I I guess I didn't put it right while entering the meeting. <laughs> my, no, that's okay. Uh, my name is Ritu and um, I've been a teacher for almost 18 years now. I've worked in India, then I've worked in Toronto and now I'm here. Um, for almost 16 to 17 years, I've worked in youth sector. This is my first year with adult ed uh, learning because I got my license the last year. And uh, yeah, here I am. I work with math, science, but professionally I've dealt with English, geography, history, all different kinds of courses. So yes. <laughs> and, and where do you teach? I teach with preschool board. I'm oh, with the Adult Ed Learning Center. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Welcome, welcome, um, Andre. My name is Andre Fortin. I'm the consultant for Western Quebec School Board. Okay. Sonia. Hi, my name is Sonia. I'm the consultant for uh, Access with Riverside School Board for Math and Science. Uh, Jessica. Hi, my name is Jessica. I am a math and science teacher at the First Nation Regional Adult Education Center. Gail. Gail Gagno, I'm the um, AGE PED consultant at Place Carche for Lester B. Pearson. Wonderful. Hello, my name is Margaret Connolly. I teach math at the Pontiac Continuing Education Center through the Western Quebec School Board. Awesome, nice to meet you. So, uh, well, and, and now we go back to our friends at Vessi. I have uh, Giovanna and Emily. Emily, you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, hi, I'm Emily Bowles. I'm a member of the Vessi AGE team. So. We are the people who love to talk about uh, digital pedagogy <laughs> and uh, my Josie in particular deals with the creation of digital resources for learning through Project RISE. And Carla, I used to teach at Nova, say hello to Colleen for me. I used to um, do math and science resource at Nova once upon a time before the new curriculum came in as well. So yeah. Awesome, nice to see you, Emily. And Giovanna? Hey. <clears throat> Excuse me. So hi, I'm uh, Giovanna, I also go by Joanne. I am um, one of the four parts of RECI. Uh, my dossier deals with center support. Um, so, uh, you know, the I work with teachers mostly, um, sometimes pet consultants as well. And um, yeah, I'm just here to see how I can support. Math is not my forte, but I can find resources for you. <laughs> it's always nice to have Lacey on our side. There are our, our, our digital uh, techies. <laughs> so, um, so let's start also, I just wanna start off by telling you, uh, welcome everybody. And I want to start off by introducing to you our partners. You just met Ressi, which is our, uh, like you said, uh, our, our digital uh, uh, techies, uh, geekies. <laughs> I like to use those words as I can. Um, there's other sources that you uh, could have access to. Like, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, BIM. Uh, well, obviously all our exams in adult ed is, is from BIM, unless it's local. And uh, we have the representative Clementina, who um, Tina was supposed to be here, but she apologized she couldn't make it tonight. Um, she will be usually in our meeting. So if you have anything to, to, to kind of report to BIM, you'll have a representative from BIM in the, in the math who will be joining us. And of course, uh, when we're looking also, you have access to complimentary service, which you have uh, Karine Jacques, 
And also here, um, this is my old uh, slide, but we also have, we're lucky on the English side, we have uh, Avi Spector. Avi Spector is going, to, is going to be the counterpart of Karin on the English sector, who, who will deal with assistive technology, and Karin Jacques deals with complementary service. Complementary service is services that deals all with like your special need or accommodation for any student in difficulties. Um, and obviously the last part is a keep shock where I and uh, my counterpart Julie is part of. And uh, what it is, is uh, what we do is really we're responsible in implementing, um, implementing uh, the new program across the province and supporting uh, all teachers in, in uh, starting off from like content development to evaluation development to support individually, group, uh, any anything. Uh, we're kind of the middleman, if you want, between uh, ministry, uh, proceeds, anyone that has any information that's relevant and important to you, that's uh, we're the middleman. So most of our information actually gets distributed through our newsletter and our website. And I'm gonna show you how that works. Um, in two seconds. So this is uh, a lot, these are all, some of the resources, there's a lot more, but these are the main official resources that you guys could kind of uh, have access uh, to. Um, today, we, like we, we wanted to, to, to start off the first day just to, to see like what's needs, what, what's your needs and what's your wants in the, in the field, right? So we, we thought, we thought uh, we'll start off by just having topics of discussion so we could pick up on what your needs and wants. And from there, and from there, we'll, we'll, we'll it'll help us, let's say, plan for the next uh, upcoming après cours uh, in math, okay? So these are a few of the topics that we're gonna discuss and we're gonna go one at a time, okay? So I will um, start off with the first one. So I don't know if uh, Helen, you would like to start it off for me. Yeah, I know, like fractions, everyone says eternal, the eternal issue with fractions. Uh, but this is really just so we can get a sense if there are really like specific stuff and maybe somebody else has a, a great way of teaching through these things. So like, for instance, my main example up there is um, number sense in the negatives. Uh, I obviously, I get them in a, in a math, predominantly in a math adjacent topic. Uh, and I do tend to find like, even at the secondary five level, if I ask my students, you know, what, what's the bigger number, minus five or minus two, a really scary number of them are like, well, minus five. That's just like, uh, <laughs> so like, <laughs> so that's what I sort of, like what I was wondering about here, like, sort of like what is there a specific numeracy topics that um, you guys are seeing in your centers that are missing even if like they come in like you know they they come in and they're in grade nine or they're in grade 10 having passed um, the lower levels in in our systems this is this is an, op an open floor discussion because um you remember this is like teachers coming from everywhere and everybody has different needs and different issues and and like when when Helen and I we thought to start off with this conversation with this conversation we, we know like students across the board are starting to have kind of a consistency of issues it seems you know so so when we talked about it I know when I was in class fractions seems to be always a topic of a, of, of a concern it seems you always have to review how to put them on common denominator, how to add fractions, that notion it seems always to be a difficult topic somehow, you know. Um, also, I know I know some teachers have, have called me and sent me email about numeracy. That was something present uh, that they haven't seen before in terms of like the concept of numbers, adding, subtracting, what is that? In terms of like picking the right operation, you know, so the, these are all issues that came across, but now we wanted to see, do you guys have this kind of, what kind of issues you have with, with your students in, 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 class, in your class? What do you see there's, you know, issues with your students? Specific um, topic we get. That. I would say across the board word problems and translating them into mathematical 
um, operations. And in the past, like in the old program, we did, like I have lots of things that we use to teach them the different lingo, how to translate pieces and bits of, you know, things from sentences and just seems as though now we're, it's a different approach and it's, um, it just seems that it's something I think in every level, I don't know if other people find that as well. I think word problems is always the biggest one. Like when they get into those big situational problems, it's more about reading comprehension than it is about math. Um, the thing I've been finding lately is I've been surprised at the difficulty with rounding. Oh. So like a student in grade nine, for example, that it was like they had never heard of such a thing. Like, you know, 6.37, that was just 6.3. And, um, you know, you just stop and you don't worry about what comes next. Or even at a higher level, like even say when they're doing um, sign law, and they do the sign of an angle and their calculator gives them this huge long decimal. And they only, for some reason, they are instinct or I don't know why they think that you never need to keep more than one decimal place. But if they keep on going and only keep the tenths, well then, you know, you don't you get, keep each step gets you further and further away, say from the correct measure of the angle, you know? Um, what I see as a concern, sometimes, of course, it is um, multi-level uh, or multi-step word problem. So if, if the word problem has probably just two steps for them to create a mathematical equation, they're okay with it. But once it gets a multi-step problem, that is where they get stuck. Another uh, issue, I don't know why that really happens, although I've... I've kind of try to provide a lot of drill around it, mathematical drill. But what happens is wherever you have uh, the, the difference between multiplying a negative number with a negative number and the and adding a negative number to another negative number. I mean, that is something I don't know what I really want to read research around it. Why is that issue? But they would get it, they would fix it. But once again, when it's going to be a part of, um, let's say, in another context, they they forget it. I don't know why. <laughs> no, no, this is an interesting one that you brought up, the last one about the, the negative numbers. Um, actually, this is also a numeracy issue, by the way. This is from the base. The, the, the concept of negative numbers is not understood. That's what it is. But... Um, but uh, I, I will look up for, for you some research uh, documents on that, by the way. We have a project coming up uh, on, on uh, numeracy, just to let you know. So these are really, really important uh, cues you're giving us. Yeah. Thank Sorry. You. I just wanted to um, just sort of say, like, even when we talk about fractions, I actually am telling students now to get calculators that have the fraction, the ABC button on them. And I feel as though that's another thing with the lower levels where we really work, you know, they have to learn about fractions, but in the end, um, all of us, you know, well, okay, if you're not a math teacher, you probably at some point learned about fractions, but a lot of people, if you don't use fractions regularly, you aren't gonna remember how to find a common denominator and do all that stuff. So sometimes I kind of wonder if are we like, should we be too concerned about it? Like, because we get students at higher levels that they can't do it by hand. And in any case, they don't have time to do it manually. They have to use their calculator. So is it uh, wrong that I'm sort of saying just get a calculator with a fraction function because you're going to be you have to use a calculator in the exam room anyway because you won't have time to do it all manually so that's a really know. good question because I, I mean I'm like I said my I'm generally science and um like you most of what we the math applications that we do you can't do with fractions right <laughs> 
<laughs> we don't get numbers that, that are nice, nice numbers. We, we never do. Um, there's always 52,000 decimals. I feel like it's one of those things that like, that's almost where the break like is. Is it, are we, is it a curriculum for, for applications of math or theoretical math? Cause right, like I know some people like I have a couple friends who did math degrees and like some of the advanced trig functions, I think, you know what I mean? Like the heavy algebra stuff, like knowing how to manipulate fractions. I mean, the one advantage I can see of, of still doing fractions, but I don't even know if it's really taught this way, is like the idea that um, a fraction on a fraction is a division, or just like the idea of a fraction as a division. I know that's not totally, that, I mean, obviously wasn't an answer to your question, but it was like my two cents. I agree with you, Helen, that when they get to the higher levels, like, when they have to manipulate, like for example, um, the trig functions where they're doing, um, uh, what are they called? The uh, yeah, they the have proofs. to add like two pi, and they have to yeah. add a proof, and they have the to proofs add two and all that. Yeah, the, the periodicity. Yes, but I feel as though at that level, if they're that far ahead they need to understand fractions but the ones that are just like dep bound let's say for hairdressing or i don't know i just feel like do they really need to know how to find a common denominator and you know like i don't know yeah no i i i, I absolutely feel i i feel you so hard on that one right because it's because you're, you're also sort of like i don't want to be streaming them at that level too right you're like Oh crap! This is something they'll need if they they happen to be the people going, like the deck process or even like the engineering depths or the design depths. But does everyone? I mean, so hard. It's... Yeah. Well, I don't know. I know my son right now, like in sec five, and what you're saying, Teresa, about using the calculator with the ABC, and he's in chemistry and physics, and they use it, by the way. So. I think I agree with like it's like almost like an old school new school thoughts thing it's like where really is it you draw the line on like where you teach it as you must teach it versus okay now we moved on let's just use the application because you got it or you didn't at, at this point it doesn't matter you need to get by because it's minimal to what you need but I don't know I think this is this is where professional. Uh, I guess I guess maybe there sh we'll, we'll have to investigate a bit further in terms of like what research say. But I think at this point, as a, as a professional, I think you have to. It's a, it's almost like an individual case. I don't know. I think they should be taught both, but the ones that I guess has to go higher, it has to be practiced at least in form of concept you need to understand when you say half of something what it means versus like i can't calculate one over two you know what i mean and i've seen that by the way <laughs> when you say one over two they can't connect that it's half some of them right but it's it's not how can i say it's not to focus on what they cannot do it's to, to focus on how do we get them there i guess but it, it is it is a difficult question to give there's no right answer in here i don't know mm -hmm. I, do you see the same thing, Carla, in your, uh, do you see these difficulties uh, when you're working with students in difficulty? Always, I mean, re regardless, when I was in the youth sector or even now in adult ed, it's, it's yeah. the same. Yeah. So do you, do you believe a calculator might solve that problem or what do you do? It's always a, a hit and miss because like I, I've, I've worked with even elementary students before and I've often found like those students that just can't master their timetables yeah. or do, or make the that link with their timetables and their division and you know that when they get to grade seven they're going to be allowed to have a calculator but right now they're not allowed to have a calculator it's just it's the same issue as like the fraction button you know like if we kind of abandon trying to have them understand the concept, then personally, I feel guilty. But then on the other hand, you're right, depending on what they're going to do or the fact that 
as soon as they leave grade six, they're going to be allowed to have a calculator anyway. I mean, really, why are we beating that issue when beating our head against the wall over an issue that is soon going to disappear in their reality? Yeah. I mean, for that, for the multiplication tables, my argument is always this. In the time that it takes me to go five times seven is 45, that it takes a student to get their, their phone out, get to the calculator app and type it, I will have saved literally thousands of hours in my lifespan in payback for even just doing the grunt drill work of, and now I write copy out my, you know, the ultra, ultra terrible, boring, I'm going to copy out my multiplication tables a hundred times. So sometimes when I get asked by my students why, that's what I tell them. I tell them yeah. that, you know. Yeah, and with my sec threes and fours, I often say that I said like, you know, on a ministry exam, when you're in a time crunch, if you have to type into your calculator five times one or two times three, you are accumulating a lot of waste of time. <laughs> you know, like, like you said, you're gonna, yeah. it's gonna come back and help you if you know them. But like, not very long ago, I was trying to help a, an elementary student and they were doing equivalent fractions. And she can't, she doesn't know her multiplication tables or reducing fractions. She doesn't know her divisions. And so, you know, if I keep going over those and then, and instead of letting her have like a multiplication table beside her or whatever, like she's, she's not going to be able to move on with the other concepts. Yeah. And and Ritu is in your in your uh, in your world also the same. Do you find the the? Yeah, um, I guess yes, that happens. Um, I'm actually from a country where uh, parents would push kids to rote memorize. So I remember I was pushed to rote memorize my times tables and everything, division, and fractions, methods, and all of that. Um, but I've also come to believe the age that we are moving into is digital age. Um, we understand, I completely understand the purpose of uh, examination and when students are sitting in the examination, how much time are they going to uh, waste over going through a calculator or bringing things just directly back from the memory. But the point here is, um, do we then also need to relook at our examination styles? Because eventually we are preparing whatever we do in a classroom is actually a preparation of how they're going to apply that that knowledge in the life outside schooling is not something which is outside of my real life schooling is a part of my real life and that is what it should prepare me for so i know had i not been a math teacher how much of times table or something i would use which i would probably in my financial literacy so Either uh, what I have come to believe is, uh, I'll give you a short answer. What I have come to believe is one, that um, my students should know the purpose of a concept. Why do fractions exist? They should know that. I'm okay with it if they know it. And two, um, there are multiple ways of uh, finding, you know, uh, putting two fractions equal through multiplication or through division or whichever way, they should be aware of different ways. If they can come up with different ways, amazing. But if they use a calculator for it, I um, for now, I am okay with it. That's fine because the digital age that they're going to go into, uh, including coding and all, I don't mind the use of calculator. They should rather be fast at using a calculator. <laughs> so. Yeah. I always I, actually, for these this time savings, I actually never use exams. I use the grocery store. Yeah. When you're walking through, do you have to walk through with a calculator working out how much everything is, or can you do the running total as you're going? Which, which would be a concept of estimation. You know, yeah. you estimate yeah. how much around my bill will yeah, be. Yeah, that's it. That's why I was saying like everything. Yeah. That's it. Estimation with multiple, like, oh, I'm going to buy four of these and they cost $90 a dollar each. Blah, 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 blah. That's, yeah. that's always where I talk about time savings. Um, and that's really what I meant. Like, just the, the, 
the every day, like you said, the financial literacy you get from having those. But it's it's interesting that you say, but this is a real life problem, like exactly walking in the market and you say approximately how much. So look at that. You have estimation, rounding, you have this. So again, having the purpose of why we're learning what we're learning, sometimes by experiment, experiencing it, connecting it, then you have a purpose for it, then it's worth learning. Because, you know, our brains are lazy and there's a lot of research on that. We don't retain an information longer than three months if we don't have to. And this is like actually pr scientifically proven, by the way. <laughs> if, if we ask you anything, past three months you're able to recognize to, to recall it but further than that you have to actually go and, and and depend on like what you wrote somewhere on an agenda on, on a notebook or somewhere to kind of remember what it was because this is how we are saving space right saving, uh, conservation of energy like we said so <laughs> it applies to everything it seems even in our classroom and our students so yeah so honestly I was going to say I clearly feel very strongly about multiplication tables. Um, I'm not like that for all the basic math ones, okay? It's just, you guys happen to pick the one thing where I'm like, oh, no, no of them. <laughs> just to let you know, by the way, I've seen something by Harvard where they're talking about where the future of math is going to end up. And they think math is gonna disappear and it's gonna learn, and it's gonna get, get into like a programming course. So, the way we're going, who knows in like how 20 years from now it's going to look like math anyway. So anyway. I'm going to say I don't do the math in my physics anymore. Like I take them to the, the point where it's all set up and then they would just have math. And then I'm like, OK, gang, like we're stopping here because this isn't. This isn't what we're doing. Yeah, I. Well, to back you up on that, Helen, actually, if you look at the evaluation, it's only 5%, the, 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 the answer. And 95% and is on the planning and the execution. So the process itself is 95% of their grade. And unfortunately, sometimes you spend so much time uh, looking at the answer, like 95% of our effort is on the answer and we forget the process. And, and truly, that's where they could get most of their marks is in the process and the communication of that process, which is, this is another point for another time, it seems, right? Um, it's Margaret. I, I teach a multi-level class. Um, it's so fractions are cer certainly something that uh, people have issues with. And I'm, I'd say that it's not just the concept of fractions, but it's remembering what to do with fractions from day to day. So a lot of what I find um, is, is the retention that, that a couple of days might go by and then a student is looking at fractions again as if it's the first time. And, and I know that we've been working on a concept for some time. So it's, certainly it's like fractions, yes, number sense, yes. And, and overall is, the, is that aspect of retention. Okay. Procedural, right? In, in in procedural, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. The uh, many of the students who are coming to the adult education center here are coming from the youth sector and in particular the work oriented um, program, and and really what you're what you're looking at is is um, trying to fill in many many years of missed curriculum to get them to um, you know, even a, a sec three level. And, and so, yeah, there's, there's uh, and retention is, tends to be a, 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 an issue with most of the students that, uh, that are coming through different programs that um, have missed and have holes in their, in their, uh, in their curriculum, uh, well, just the curriculum they've been exposed to. Do you, Jessica, feel the same way? Uh, very much so. It's the frustration of teaching A, B, C, and then A, and then B, and then A, and again. <laughs> and, uh, and then have your uh, administrators asking, like, when do people finish? It's like, oh, <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it's hard when I have to go back. 
and 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 I was joke with my student like I hope there I wish there's no Christmas but then we can just keep going without you guys forgetting anything. Yeah. So you have a student right there laughing <laughs> a little bit. But <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's a retention and also is for I'm not only teaching math I'm also teaching how to learn how to write notes how to organize. And somehow a lot of students, um, even if they successfully pass through um, high school, they don't have that soft skill yeah. either. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that is, it's, it's funny you say that because that is an issue also elsewhere. I assisted recently to a science, uh, a science discussion group round table and that was one of the main issues they had is soft skills like of course the science and all but it's not you're, there's more to it than just whatever yeah and that was a big issue among the teachers they say like they don't know how to talk they don't know how to communicate they don't know how to get information from here to the paper so how to work in collaboration they don't know how to be themselves with the material so yeah that that was other stuff than the math itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I know that some centers have started. A couple of centers that I know of have started um, that when students enroll in adult ed, they the first courses they take are the CST courses to try and like set them up for success throughout the rest of their time in adult education. And I think that that's could potentially be an interesting approach. Um, that they have, they do a course on, you know, like how to deal with an evaluation. What's my learning plan? What are some learning strategies that I can implement that are that are general? And then hopefully by the time they are ready to take a math class, then you won't have to do as much work filling in those those soft skill gaps. Yeah, yeah. These 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 are our present. These are courses that do exist in some centers. And if you're interested, maybe if you have a uh, like consultant, a pedagogical consultant, ask them for it. And if not, you could write to us and write to me, or uh, you know, write to us, and um, I will refer you to like we'll send you more information about those if you're interested. Um, Don, a new face, welcome. So, how's your reality in your center? Mute. Uh, hi. Um, so I work for the Houston Township School Board as a distance education tutor. Um, and, um, you know, so it's, 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 it's a different dimension because I don't see my students in person. So, um, and it's a bit, I'd have to say the distance education is a bit of sink or swim. Like it's not meant for students who can't be independent learners because um, honestly, I just don't get paid to do like hour long Zoom tutorials week after week, hour after hour. So it's a really, it's different than in person learning for sure, for sure. Um, you know, they're just responsible for going through the book. If they have certain questions, they ask. I'll do a little tutorial session when they need, but most of the time they're working on their own. I'm correcting their things, giving feedback, they're writing their exams. And yeah. uh, what kind of difficulty do you find that they have? did you do have you seen like uh, let's say uh, uh, like let's say a pattern of difficulty or everyone is in the like is, really you know. I can't there's not one thing that stands out um, that everybody has problems with some things are easier statistics seem to be easier for most all the statistics units functions you know when it gets in the quadratic and the exponential that's a bit sticky sometimes um, but yeah you know it really depends at the level of the student and uh, their background and what they struggle in and actually I think the thing that all of my students struggle with when they first come to me is confidence if the adult sector, it's often because they've experienced a lot of failure, um, robbed of a lot of successes and things, and just their paths in life that they weren't ready to learn math at that time, and now they're ready. Mm -hmm. um, so me, the first, my first job is to build the connection and to build up their confidence, because without that, they're not going to learn anything, and it'll take them longer. So <laughs> trying to really, really, you know, hold that carrot close at the beginning to, to get them on board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, 
thanks to like if we take a look uh, here in the chat, I have Sonia that said just to clarify, Emily is referring to the committing to success, the CST courses. You know, so these are oriented. Like, um, you want to talk to it, uh, Sonia, just to to clarify to everybody. Uh, sure, we we do use them at Riverside. Um... We use them as orientation courses. We have a teacher, she actually uses them as orientation courses for both adult ed and VT. And uh, there are four or five of them. I believe there's five of them. There's five, okay. And yeah, so, so she uses those courses to teach students, uh, like Emily said, about soft skills, how to set uh, long -term, short term and long term uh, goals for themselves, educational and personal goals. Uh, it helps with some of those, um, you know, self-regulation, some of those executive function skills, how to study, how to take tests, uh, things like that. That's what she covers in those courses. And they're, they're a lot of fun. They're well-received. They're short in duration. They're about 25 hours. Um, it is a nice way to, for a, particularly a new adult ed student to just sort of ease their way into adult education. Yeah, uh, and, and just to, to add to what Sonia said, uh, Jessica, just put a link if you want in the chat uh, for a workbook, workbook tree. So yeah, if, if anybody wants, uh, is interested. Yeah, and also uh, Gail had put uh, also a, a link uh, for engagement and um, Gail, uh, you want to talk to it a little bit where you found it? And uh, well, it's also, it's the Mies program for CST, so we're also implementing it here, but uh, specifically with an alternative group that we have that Michelin used to be part of, and we're going to see how it goes with them, because it's also going to be synced with them learning math and science, um, in addition to English and history, uh, but I really hear what Dawn is saying about the confidence piece. It's almost like people have to unlearn this very um, deep sense that they aren't good at math and the, and the fear that comes with it. Uh, mm -hmm. And once, if there's some way that they can unlearn that and begin fresh, then I think that the concepts would be stickier. And, and I, I get the fear that Jessica is saying, you break for Christmas and they come back and you start all over again in math because there's something fundamental that's not connecting. And I do wanna say that Michelin, you were such a strong teacher of ours and you've had those students at that level. And I suspect you have some ideas too to share. <laughs> oh, in my practice, like honestly, just personally, this is one thing I, I, I found and, and thank you Gail for that. Uh, it's just that sometimes you know what it is. It's it's I personally cannot learn if I don't connect because if you don't like your teacher, it seems you do the job half excuse my my word but half a job because you need just to get over it. But if you love your teacher, or it seems you're doing it for them, but really we know psychologically you're not right. But you need that connection. So I used to spend a whole week, the first week when they used to come in. I used to do a lot of. Um, uh, I, I, of course, I taught math, but part of the class was always like making games and, and having conversation and making them like decontracted because walking into the classroom, some of the physical aspect I remember at the time was like, it's grinchy, like they would walk in and they're tense and the hoodie on and they sit in the corners. So I used to like make them play games like, okay, what's your favorite fruit and talk about it. And they're like, this is not math. I say, no, it doesn't have to be always math, you know? So you, you, you laugh about jokes and you get them to be in that zone and then you can learn because if you're in a, in, a, in, a, in a flight or fright position, nothing's going in. So uh, I, I used to always take that first week for team building. I know it would cut off on my material, my content, but if I didn't have that team building, my support system in place in the classroom, I, I would not keep them, <laughs> first of all. And I'm, I'm repeating what they know. And, and the other thing is when time gets tough, also they need more than just me. They need a colleague who's having like that, that constant saying, that constant push, it's okay, I'm going through it too, like, you know. Um, and one, one thing I use personally that always worked nicely, I always mechanically generated success. 
like I would make sure <laughs> some of my questions in any test I gave that anyone could do, anyone, even the ones who can count, they can do it. So it's nice that even if you give like a five question, let's say quiz, a couple of questions are baby questions. So even the hard one, they'll probably attempt it on writing something, but always giving back an empty, you know, assessment of any sort. It, it, it does something to you, but if you wrote something and you're able to get some like check marks or a sticky mark, uh, whatever it is, even if you know it's mechanically generated, it's fine. It's just to build that confidence that, oh my God, I actually got something on that paper right, you know? So for the moments that they don't, I could bring back up and say, look, but you did it here. Like You can do it. So if you got two on, four, uh, two on five now, Maybe next time let's aim for three, you know, and slowly build this up because the minute they kind of loosen up that stress gate, suddenly <laughs> things start flowing. But again, you're fighting on years and years and years of, of, I told you so, you know, you have to undo that. I told you so with like those little tiny successes, but yeah, Helen, uh, Helen, uh, you, you had a question too, also, you wanted to. Yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was just for Dawn, because I mean, what she described was very similar to the individualized that I did even when they were in person, right? Because when I was an individualized, I had all math, all science in one room. So there still wasn't time for me to sit down and just guide one person through like something for an hour. Um, I always found my students extremely like, I don't really know how to describe it. They super didn't want to hand in work, but they really, really wanted to do the exam. <laughs> and like, does anybody have any like tricks for like overcoming that? Other than obviously just bloody mindedness, which is what I used, which was too bad, so sad, do it. <laughs> I was wondering like, anybody have any tricks for like coaxing them into, even in my, some of my teacher led courses, like, like weekly quizzes and stuff like that. They're so like, I, I don't want to show you any of my work. I could tell you what I did. And some of the things, this is just, again, ideas. I had a checklist of everything I had in my answer. So whatever you do, if you want to get the mark, you have to show me this, 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 this. Every time. <laughs> so when you get a mark, you get a mark for every check mark that you do, that you, you find me the information of it. And another little tricky thing that I've done, which is, I found it's a bit, you know, sneaky, but it works. I, I, you know, the first day you usually give them like almost like a placement test to see like how, how they're doing or where do you start? I always like, I include usually the review test, you know, like the, the, the last test. Uh, the pretest, sorry, in my review. And I tell them, this is not counted and do whatever. And they give it, they're probably going to give it to me empty. They do give it to me empty. And what I do during the teaching, every question on that pretest or that assessment test, I go through it in class and they ask them to hand it back. And by the end, when we get to the pretest, Helen, so <laughs> they, they've done them all. <laughs> and they say, well, I don't know how to do this. And that's where I, when I pick them up, I bring them back and I say, remember this question, you did it here. You've got this question, you did it here. So they see proof for themselves that they did it. But usually the question comes after the teaching directly, you know? And, and I did that for a SEC 350, uh, 3051, uh, 3053, a geometry class, because it was such a hard course to teach for them. So I took each question and they didn't even realize that they were doing the pretest throughout the course. But what the, at the end, I gave them exactly the same pretest that I gave them the first day, and they were able to do it. And the ones who said, no, I can't do this, I was able to show them because I had to do the exit cards, and the exit card was every question on that pretest. So, I mean, this is tricks that I kind of develop on the field, depends on the group you have, but I don't know what you guys, anybody, other suggestion, Sonia? Um, I've seen one individualized teacher put, um, he, he didn't identify his students by name. I think he used their, uh, their ID or something like that. 
on a, he put, he listed everybody's ID on a poster that was on the wall. Uh, and when it came to homework, he was, he was using the SOFAD uh, books. The students were using the SOFAD books. And he basically put chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, whatever, you know, number of chapters there were in a book. And just when he saw the students work, he would put a check mark on this poster. So the students saw their own individual progress visually on this very big poster in the classroom. And then there was this friendly competition going on between the students who were studying uh, the same book. Uh, it was something so simple, uh, simple, but it, but it seemed to work well when it came to making sure they did their homework and uh, showing them their work. It's a great idea. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, well, thank you for your input on that first one. So at least I know where I need to go uh, in that perspective. Um, how about something more positive? What our kids are good at? <laughs> what do you guys think? They must be good at something. <laughs> I know um, right now, our one of our math teachers is very pleased right now because his the groups are getting better um, at doing that explanation of identifying what it is they need to do and actually like communicating it. Whereas a few years ago, that was much more of a problem. There was a lot of students really did want to just be able to like write the answer and get their full marks. I would say students have also started questioning why they're learning a certain concept to actually reach the purpose of the concept, which is very beautiful <laughs> that they ask why, well, how is it going to help me? Tell me, and then I will learn this. <laughs> Making purpose, awesome. <laughs> Do you find your students are better um, digital users than they were? Yes. Yes, yeah. even me as a teacher. Okay, okay. So I guess it's a, it's a mixed feeling. Some are, some aren't. Well, okay. It, it's don't you guys find it's ironic sometimes how you think the digital native crowd have difficult like they're very good in like using what they know how to use, but when it comes to classroom use, like certain apps and certain things, they have difficulty doing. I, I sometimes find that with a lot of them, uh, if it's not optimized in like a certain way, because we tend to be asking more from our, our online learning platforms and things like that, like the stuff we use is closer to a technical program. Like it's a lot of the software we're using in education is closer to like the stuff they're going to be using, if you like, in a workplace. Um, so it's not Instagram. It's, it's not designed to have necessarily the lowest walls and, and no pain points, right? It's, it's, that's not its purpose. And I find they have trouble in that environment, unless, oddly enough, they've worked retail and have had to deal with the point of sale system. <laughs> well, I think COVID kind of accelerated the process, right, for everybody. Yeah, Emily? Yeah, actually, that's something that... Um... I was speaking to uh, a company recently that uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to um, use, like get sports data to help with sports broadcasting. Um, and they were interested in working with a teacher to develop a learning situation where students are analyzing um, data for the one of the data collection courses in math four. I can't remember the course code. I do have it written down though, um, to kind of give it more of like a real world flavor. This is where um, math is going. This is how math can be relevant in everyday life. Uh, so I think that's something, I think some of the programs do um, do that really well, but like how can we use technology to really make that real for them so they can see how it could apply in their life and where it might lead. That could be an idea for a working group maybe later on, if there's a need for that. 
statistics uh, seems to be the easiest course, <laughs> would be made, which is great, which is a great, great idea. It's uh, probably algebra and geometry, whereas I think uh, is the bigger uh, challenges, but it's, it's a great, great idea. And, and yeah, definitely we'll, we'll put it on our uh, maybe suggestion for, for you know, a working group. Thank you, Emily, that's great. I said, like, I don't know about other people, but like, I, um, like my students have no trouble with Zoom, right? Like I said, anything that's like a, a, a proper consumer product, they don't have difficulty with. But anything, the minute you start getting into anything that's a little more tech, like I'm thinking like Edmodo, we, uh, we, not Edmodo. Uh, although some of them have trouble with Edmodo as well, but less so uh, Moodle. Like we use we use Moodles, and it's it's always a learning curve for some of them at at navigating the system. And I, I'm like I said, I'm really hesitant to call that a flaw with Moodle, uh, just because um, I've been doing a lot of back end stuff right now. Uh, because of my uh, my being a part union and Moodle is probably the closest like I said that they're going to get to like real like real programs like <laughs> what it will actually look like what they're going to be expected to use at some point in their life yeah um, at our center at Access, the teachers are getting more experimental with their math, particularly in the lower levels. Um, and I would say we're getting better at that, working collaboratively. It's been so long since people have been together in the same classroom doing group work. So it's uh, we're slowly getting back to doing that kind of stuff uh, and making math because we can work in groups like that. Math is becoming more experimental again and a little more engaging than it previously previously was so um, I think we're getting better at that as well as the technology mm -hmm. thank you yeah Gail I just um, thought I might bring up the deboulage and how that's going to affect uh, the math situation um, so you know I see nodding heads but uh, if, if anyone's not familiar, I mean, if people can't provide evidence that they have passed secondary one and secondary two and secondary three, they're going to have to go back to secondary one, regardless of how they place in a placement test. So anyone new to the center. So it does provide an opportunity to really work at developing those foundational skills in SEC 1 and SEC 2. And, and I think that's too what's missing when people jump into the 4 CST and you know they're memorizing things rather than really understanding. And I know that the whole reform is, that's not what it's based on and it's hard to imagine anyone succeeding in that way. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of people are going into classes at too high a level without having the real foundational knowledge. And I think that could be one good feature of this déboulage is to look at how we can, what uh, Sonia is saying, you know, to revitalize collaborative teaching and learning and bringing new life into those programs. But it's also hard when you're a single teacher at some of these schools to be collaborative. But this is why this is such a great opportunity too to have people come together here. Yeah. Well, thank you, Gail, for bringing this point because it really, I like this year, I found it interesting. I don't know how it is at your centers uh, or you and your class teachers. Uh, have you noticed there is a need for a numeracy this year? I know I've been called up this year, like from a couple of centers with like help for numeracy, it's not even like sec one, sec two, not even pre-secondary. It's like just number sense. Like what operation do I need? How do I use this? Do you find that you're having numeracy issue? I know we're putting something together for that. It's just, uh, it's just I found it. there's a wave that suddenly uh, it's, it's coming that wasn't there before or maybe was was there always, but wasn't as big. <laughs> yeah, Jessica? For me, that has always been there. Okay. Um, the, like from, I got a range of students who are 
for at a very, very basic to just uh, they're having difficult with something new they're, learn they're learning, like factoring. Mm -hmm. So I have like a, a very wide spectrum of students. And yeah, it's, it, it can be uh, frustrating sometimes be just because they're all in the same class. And it's just like uh, Helen said, uh, in individualized, you can't really spend an hour with one person. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it inevitably, I feel somebody multiple students are dropped, like forgotten during a class. And, and usually uh, students like, who are having trouble with that are also having trouble with literacy. Yeah. So I can't just give them something to look at either. And I'm worried a little bit with the dev rod because I'm afraid that if I give students like one book that have like a cartoon seal on them, just because they're kind of low, that they were going to give up because of uh, that sense of why am I doing this? Even though I totally agree, they need to review the basic, but I thought that's what the teacher are here for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh well. Well, just to make you feel better, Jessica, there is something coming to adult ed. It's like we're, 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 we're working on that. There is something gonna be done in literacy for adults. Okay. Yeah, Margaret? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, numeracy, of course, uh, it, it, and literacy, it's the, the, the requirement for students to understand the vocabulary um, used in math as well. So it's, it's, you know, one more thing that is layered on top, which they do need to, to know and understand. Um, I'm just curious because we use um, at the center now it's I think it's been three years we've been using math help services is anybody else using math help services as an online tool with their workbooks as well because I certainly find the the so fed books the the level of literacy in those books is like way way above grade nine, say, for instance, if it's, you know, if you're looking at how those books are written, I found the SOFED books very hard for students to, to just navigate the language, let alone the, the math requirements. And math help services, I mean, it is, at least there's that multi-dimensional audio, visual colors, you know, being able to look at a lesson multiple times and examples, you know, so I don't know if that's, um, I see some heads nodding. I'm hoping that, yeah, the service that people are using because it's it's pretty good. It is, it is. Yes, Don, you wanted to. Uh, we switched to Math Help Services at Distance Education uh, two years ago now, two falls ago. We met with John MacArthur and he presented it to us and I was just like, whoa, this is exactly what I need because especially as a distance education tutor, I'm never beside them. So I can never be beside them if they get stuck. And this is the way that it's made is they can unstick themselves very quickly. Um, so it's really increased their effectiveness and it's in, decreased my workload <laughs> because they're able to, to get through places where they would normally be stuck and they would only have me to rely on. They've got resources, they have videos, they have uh, notes and things, uh, they're great. And I was super disappointed because when SOFAD redid uh, the secondary four books two years, two, almost three years ago, I guess now, and I was really looking forward to it and they came out and they were horrible so many words not enough like there was easy and then hard not enough in the middle and the students were just failing they were failing all of them and uh so we we took the jump to math help services two years ago for secondary four and then we moved to secondary three last year and then this fall we started implementing for secondary one and two and it's going really well yeah Um, okay, then this is great. At least we have some wonderful things coming out of COVID. It seems at least technology got checked, improved quite a bit. Um, now, this is an interesting one, and it was brought up because it was a request of a teacher, actually. As a teacher, which topic are you the least comfortable with? The fact that we're, we're teaching all levels, you know, and all topics, 
um, is there something that you're more like you would like to have, let's say, more information about, you know? Um, I know some, like I know uh, the couple of teachers that I spoke to, like technical drawings, you know, uh, that was something difficult uh, to teach when your yourself is not very comfortable with. Uh, so if there is maybe resources on that or maybe videos that is more like adult, ed, you know, uh, context uh, geared, you know, um, like we said, of course, fractions. Some, some people said, well, the exit cards, like, can I know more about it? Because I know we have to use it and some people use it functionally but they don't necessarily use it to its potential or how it's used. So these are like areas that people would like to learn more about. Do you have anything that you would like to maybe, would like to know more about? Like if I can get somebody, a speaker or a specialist in something that will just uh, enrich us? Well, I don't know. Rubrics, the famous rubrics. And by the way, they're changing just to let you know, <laughs> but it's coming, <laughs> it's coming. So, I don't know. Uh, these these topics are for online learning or uh, uh, in person learning. Either or, whatever you need. This is like it's more like what would you need to do to, to like to to make your job easier for you. What would you um, need? Like, would you need more inf like more information about what specific topic? Uh, more information about assessment of competencies through online learning. Uh, not really in person, but online now. I think the technical drawing, um, ex like, I feel as though that could be something to help our students. Um, like that um, in SEC 3, the, uh, the different views, the different things, it's... So as they say in French, it's probably be down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Something to help them, some kind of tools that would make those more real. Yeah. Yeah. And and Carla, do you have anything you would want more information about? Well, one thing that comes to mind that I'm a little unsure about since I'm new to adult ed is like electronic device or access to electronic devices. Like I find most of our students are using their phone. So like, yes, they are more digitally aware and maybe having COVID is basically gotten them more comfortable with using, you know, teams and, and online learning tools. But at the same time, they're doing it from their phone and they're using their phone as their calculator. And, and it's, it's just prone to errors, I find, and very difficult to, for them, they don't, they don't complain. That's what they, I guess that's what they want. But I mean, to me, it would be better if they had like a, a even just a bigger screen and and I'm trying to convince them all to you know hurry up and, and get a scientific calculator rather than using their phone since they won't be allowed to have their phone for the exam and I'm a big believer in learn how to use your calculator before the day of the exam because every calculator is different but anyway that seems to be like a an ongoing fight I'm having <laughs> But I don't know, I, I, I couldn't sit in a classroom all day and stare at my phone screen doing math problems. No way. Yeah. Do all your students have Chromebooks? Like, do they have access in school for Chromebooks? Nothing? No, nothing. Okay, so it's just bring your own device. Yeah, there's a few, like, we have a couple, a few iPads or like, there's a room with computers, but you don't want to send them out of the room to another room with computers. It's, you know, they're missing the, the lesson or the opportunity for, for assistance, you know? Mm. So they, they bring their own, but I don't know, like, uh, I don't know if there's any measure that, that helps cover those sorts of, of devices or not. I was going to say in our center, we, ha we have like iPad carts and stuff. And when I was in individualized, there was always a, a standing offer that students could 
I think a little bit of that um, is also our perception of them. Mm -hmm. I do always recommend that they have a separate, if they're going to be working off their phone, they have a separate calculator just because flipping through the apps is, is a little bit janky at times. Um, but what was I starting with? Sorry, it's been a, it's been a long day. Um, <laughs> They pref basically say no one ever took me up on my offer of the iPad. And I'm going to straight up admit at this point, being an old millennial, um, I have my laptop uh, with my great big extra spare monitor um, for my work. But I mean, I'm also like doing a few hundred email, like not a few hundred, but I'm doing like loads of emails every day and like um, uh, some basic graphic design work. Like at home for my my daily function, it's my phone. Like I, I never open a laptop really. And if I'm going to, the only time I use my desktop and stuff like that is honestly because I've, um, I'm streaming tell I'm streaming stuff onto my TV. Like, so I, I don't know how much of that's just a, a generational thing at this point. Interesting. So I think if I can add to this, I think like um, topics, I think like I see their online engagement and mindful selections of teaching examples. Those are both and student focused learning. Like we definitely students are into the digital stuff. We're I think at our center, we use math help services a lot. I don't know if other centers do. Um, so I think those types of things, math help services is very good. I'm wondering maybe there's even better out there. Like, sorry, math help services. <laughs> yeah. Well, these these digitals, uh, the, these uh, digital uh, sites or apps or you know engage like these tools are to support learning, right? So whatever tool is needed to support, then be it, right? So, but the thing is they have options. This is what's nice because I don't know in your classroom, but in my classroom, once upon a time, like 15 years ago, you had majority of adults who want paper and pen and you had the few <laughs> who, who were like the youngsters. Now it's the other way around. You have still that one, two adult and now the majority are the 16 to 25, right? So there has to be a shift, you know, but we can't forget our adults and the youngsters are forcing us to shift our ways. So yeah, that's the, I think, perception sometimes. Even I, like, I'm, I'm, res I'm sometimes reserved on, on how I want to deliver because that's my security also because that's all I know. But sometimes what I know is not what they need. They need different. And that puts me in a very uncomfortable zone that, you know what, we're learning together. That's the part that sometimes makes you feel, you know, I guess, but maybe we'll look into maybe options. Yeah. But they want the paper too. I find, especially the lower level students, they want handouts. Like it's nice to have digital stuff, but they want, they love handouts. They just love it. You know, the manipulatives, believe it or not, the hands-on manipulative. When I talk one and two, at the beginning, everybody looked at it, it's like, oh no, this is for babies. But believe me, the, the minute I left them in the center of my table throughout the whole semester, suddenly it became the thing to do. Like I know I've, I've done some studies, uh, I've read some studies that says if you wanna uh, get the flow of creativity out, just give people to play with Play-Doh for 60 seconds. Like just empty your mind and just play with Play-Doh, make shapes, whatever it is. It just takes away the tension and the anxiety because math, you know, they're coming in with so much luggage and, you know, ex like bad experience. So just having that kind of like dissociation for a moment, like it almost like just, you know, gives them that breathing room to say, you know, to breathe, to let me try again. And, and you know, 
believe it or not, <laughs> it works. <laughs> Even though they try to resist it at first, but suddenly it's like that stress ball, that like spike ring, that suddenly uh, you, you have like these stretchables, you know, whatever. They'll play with it. They'll talk with, that, with it while they're doing it and they don't even realize they're doing it, you know? And, uh, you know, so normalizing what is not normal if you want. So yeah, the lower grades are... Uh, interesting so yeah so maybe uh, what about differentiation and learning would be something you would like to maybe hear about more like if it gets uh, the uh, the assistive technology uh, avi to talk about it more or or karen jack who who's uh, sec services would that be something you'll be interested in yeah yeah okay. perfect okay so all right Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Um, yes, uh, Sana. Yeah, I, I haven't heard from my teacher uh, anything about like a specific topic that they're having trouble teaching, but it is that issue of my student reads a complex task and doesn't know how to get started. They're teaching problem solving strategies, but they get so intimidated. And, and, you know, it goes back to their confidence when they read a complex task. And even though they've been taught the strategies, they, they get so nervous and they don't know where to begin. Um, also, are they relatable? Are the complex tasks relatable to our particular clientele? Mm -hmm. Here at Riverside, we, we just met last week and Michelin, you know, I spoke to you a couple of days ago about it. You know, reordering the books so that the content is more cohesive. And so hopefully that will help with the transfer. And now we're looking at uh, maybe even writing our own local exams because we wanna make the complex tasks uh, more doable and more, more relevant to our particular clientele. Yeah. yeah. I know. So no, it, it hasn't been about a specific math topic but it is all about you know the big picture speaking the difficulty in transferring the information from one concept to another or from one grade level to the next and and breaking down a complex task into smaller parts yeah so so maybe something like in maybe differentiation in math in t in, in in progressively guiding them from a very simple learning situation to a more complex like to practice the strategies something like that might help yeah i guess um you know scaffolding the steps and then slowly removing those scaffolds um, it just seems like there has to be a lot of repetition per yeah. type of question before you can move on to the next time. and you know is that time necessarily there or not? It's, it's, yeah. it's usually not there that kind of time <laughs> I find a lot of students get really hung up on knowing every step at the very beginning. Like if they can't visualize the whole problem in one go, they just sort of shut down and they don't even do any step. So I know uh, one thing I, I really try to focus on a little bit with some of them is just like, listen, just do something. <laughs> Leave that first bit of explaining what you're going to do. Actually do that last. And then just just try something on your page. Maybe you'll find a new inf bit of information and maybe that'll help. I've had a little bit of success with that because like I said, I have, I've repeatedly run into this issue where like a lot of them, and I guess it strikes me as odd because of course, most of the time when I read a, a, a task, I'm not looking at it as like, okay, what's my step one? What's my step two? What's my step three? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I, you know what I mean? And I think there's something there as well, like for a lot of the students where there's a, a disconnect. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if other people find that as well. Yeah, Margaret? Yeah, I was just going to add, because it, it certainly um, follows the all of what we're talking about. I mean, even just the production of a memory aid to go into a math exam, Again, I have students who have never sat a math exam and there's, you know, and, and they've never done a memory aid. 
Um, I have I have memory aids pinned all over my board because students, I ask them if I can keep them after they're finished their exam. They can always take them at any point, but at least, you know, again, there's exemplars for, for students to see not my idea of a, of a memory aid, but other students, how they structure a memory aid. And, you know, we're lucky to have um, a resource person who, I can say it's like, you know, Nancy, you need to work with this person one on one and, and start helping them build a memory aid because they've never done it. And I mean, like, and that's something that, I mean, it is helpful going into the exam, but if you don't know how to even put that together, uh -huh. you, you, you get in there and you don't know how to use a memory aid. <laughs> uh -huh. Right. And, and we all know if it's not, use during the, the, the learning, it's very difficult to yeah. just show up on an exam and suddenly know how to use it, right? So it, it's weird. It's almost like you have to build a memory aid from day one <laughs> and then, sorry, <laughs> we all let you, you know, it's almost like, you know, <laughs> have it from day one and then say, okay, this is a template. <laughs> Let's work mm -hmm. with it, you know? So yeah, sorry. Yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, like that I when I um, prior to being a HRC consultant, I was doing math and science resource. And so I was like frantically doing all the exercises in the books before the students that I'd be working with would get to them. And as I was going through it, I made myself little cue cards every time I learned a new formula, every time, you know, there was like a new vocab word, like what is this type of equation called? I would like make a little cue card for it. And then by the time I got to the end of the book, I had like a little stack of things that I could prepare on like a one page sheet. And like, this is all the knowledge from this course. And, and I love that idea of like doing it bit by bit as you're going. Yeah, Don, you wanted to add to it? Uh, yeah, I actually have a prepared memory sheet for all of my courses as well, and I send it to my students with my welcome email at the beginning. Uh, so they use it as a, you know, it helps them to show where they're starting and where they're, sorry, I use them on the Zoom. <laughs> um, that it just helps them to show like where they're starting and where they're going to and it helps them when they're in a certain part they can look at it and go okay well concisely what am I learning here and to help them review so instead of giving them something at the end I give it to them at the beginning an example that they can use and then when it comes time to make their own memory they have it they know what it looks like they've been using it kind of the whole time and it's a little less mysterious so yeah a beautiful idea, beautiful idea. And, and I, you remind me of something that uh, one of uh, another teacher I was talking to like a couple of days ago, and she mentioned what she does is when she presents her class and you know, she gives the outline, you know, she has all the topic at the beginning, you know, uh, light out. And what she does is one of the thing is periodically or maybe closer to, to midways or, or to the end, she does like, she, she'll tell the student, okay, time out. Let's take a look at all these topics and put them in a, in a concept map. Now, okay, we learned this, we learned this, we learned this. How do they fit together? Who like, and make them do their own concept map. And, and she picks them up periodically just to see how they think and how they connect things. And, and this is where it's interesting because she said, you know, a lot of the best students, her best students, when she looks at their concept map, she says, oh boy, this shouldn't be there, you know? And then she has to work on it right away, you know, to, to, to go through it with the students say, no, no, where you put it here, you linked it to this, but really this should go there or like rework, let's say the mislearned opportunities you know what I mean that you only realize sometimes much later that they connected it somewhere wrong and and you don't you, you know you, you didn't catch it. it's almost like too late you know and, and that's with the shortcuts in math right so like for example you show a shortcut and suddenly like you know you only notice that the way they're using the shortcut is correct in this and this but they used it wrong somewhere else because they connected it this is the way I need to do when I have this situation, but they were not able to kind of 
truly understand it. So she did that and I thought it was smart. I thought it was brilliant. And she would do it periodically, like the beginning of class, like where you think things are. So she will know where they're starting off, if there's any changes. And towards the end, she allows them to do a full concept map where, she, where they have to put examples and their own definitions under everyone. So you could see exactly their synthesis of the topic, of the subject. And she goes, that to her, it mean like you could see exactly if the students really were able to do the links, they understand it, they have the vocabulary. So she, she this I thought was like a amazing strategy personally, because I review never thought activity, about it. Michelin. Excuse me. Is it for review? If they do that at the end of the course or like? Well, she she does it at the beginning because she needs to know where they're coming from. Okay. You know. And she does it periodically in the middle to see how if things shuffled. And at the end, she makes them do it as a, as a review activity, like now synthesize. And this is one way of, of knowing if they actually learned what they need to learn with examples and stuff. And that becomes really their concept map becomes their like memory aid in a way, you know? But it's, it's just, I thought it was brilliant that you thought about it, you know? Uh, yeah. I find students need a lot of coaching for the uh, concept maps that being they're like one of my favorite things but I feel like nobody likes concept maps when you start doing them. I know when I did them I had to really. I actually usually do it the first few times we do it they do it in groups. Um, and they do a big one that they um, preferably have to show other people it works better I find in a traditional classroom because I like I said I do it in groups and I have to show other people they have to present it. Then it becomes a little, I want more stuff. Um, and I find that you really have to start by encouraging them to put everything on there, like everything. And I, and really encourage them to do it because otherwise, you know, they put like the two things um, and then they don't put anything else. <laughs> But 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 the, I yeah, still I love still, them. I still love them. I like yeah, I still do I, them. They're just I, not mad. They're not magic. Yeah, no, no, no. But I love the idea what you said, Helen, the fact that they you know, sometimes they may not know how to do it alone, but they could do it in group and they could feed off each other. And we know the best learning happens when they're in group. Right. And they teach each other and they have that conversation. I think that's brilliant. Even like if you think about it, if you have a team of teachers sometimes just to agree on sequencing of topics having a bunch of teachers in a room and asking them, okay how would you teach at, at, at 30 51 and let's see the different variety of it you know and it's brilliant I think it's just the, having a lot of minds together and coming up with like that I think that's brilliant personally uh, yeah and yes, okay. just to add to that, I think this is great. And taking um, another concept and math to show the, uh, the 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 concept map, like using something easier, like a subject, like let's say Christmas, and building it with them. It's you know, so they understand the strategies, and after that, we can use it in a math concept. So yeah. it becomes you know easier. But I, I love the idea. Yeah, yeah, and and I think the fact that you're sharing it with others work wonderfully, and and just to add to that, actually, the teacher was doing it online just to let you know, and she used GeoGebra. In GeoGebra, there's an option called Notes, and then from there, it's called Concept Map, and from there, that option, she actually worked virtually with the students to do that. You know, so yeah, I could just imagine it live. It's even even better, but her her concept that was done actually completely virtual just to let you know which was interesting because you know who who knows right um yeah no there's a lot of fun stuff there's a lot of fun stuff uh, yeah. it's having all these heads together right so um let's move on to the next one now how do you do that one this is a hard one <laughs> how do you support missing prior knowledge what is the most uh, common missing prior knowledge and how effective is this support? So I know it's a multi-question question, but you know, if let's say you're teaching a level like, like Carla who's teaching three, four, five, right? 
somebody comes in and you, you still have a time limit on things. I don't know if you all have time limits. If you work on, are you all in an individualized setting or magistral or, you know, or you do both? Is there a deadline where they have to finish a, a module or? Is well, for the, for our advanced maths at four or five, um, yeah, they're, they're all together. They're not working all independently. Yeah. But they have to finish by a certain date, right? Yes. Okay. So Teresa, you too, your center? Uh, we're all individualized. So this isn't really when they're missing prior knowledge. We just, we just go out and find something for them to, you know, we basically cater to what their needs are. Okay. So that's what we do. Okay. Well, you we have a deadline. We, we, we fill in the gaps issues. with whatever, you know, like it used to be, I have like a million handouts and now it's like digital, you know, like watch this video, but then do this handout because I want to see, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And read to you the same thing. Um, I, one, I see um, to be able to solve a simple one variable linear equation uh, that is something which is usually worked on in grade six and seven but even by the time they come to grade 10 uh, they, they do not know what to do with an equation to be able to find the value of a variable even when it's just one variable let alone two variables in an equation um, and the other thing again is uh, addition subtraction multiplication and division of integers uh, because basically, even to be able to solve a single step, uh, one variable equation, they need the concept of integers. So that's where they, I see most of them, they need, so what I do with them in terms of support is a lot of drill. So that it's sort of like how we talk about something becoming, uh, you know, innate for you from your uh, kinesthetic, your concrete, uh, hands-on memory to eventually your, uh, you know, cognitive memory. Uh, it, it does help most of them a lot of times, but it's, it takes a lot of time because then you have to give multiple same kind of problems for just addition of positive negative integer, then multiple different problems for uh, positive and negative multiplication of those numbers. So a lot of that drill, but it takes, it eats into a lot of time. That's the thing. So, so what do you do? They, these, they have to do it on their own, is that it? Outside the course or? Yeah, this, this is something not on their own, but I mean, I would give them drill worksheets for it that they practice such that it becomes innate. So the strategy does work. It helps them. The dr drill strategy helps, but it takes a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, so, I yeah. find, um, I have found that too I, with the other things. I, I know that rote's fallen a little bit out of favor. Um, that's why I put in the chat, the, the which is if you can't do it the easy way by concept, you're going to do it the hard way by, um, by rote. I always, to one, I find if you want, it, want students to do it, you have to assign it to them. You can't just tell students that they need to cover something. They will never cover their missing prior knowledge. They just won't. Like, lead them to water and they'll just sit there and not drink. Um, but uh, I always find it very interesting that we're so opposed to wrote in the intellectual uh, pursuits when if you told um, a coach like a basketball coach that they should only ever have student uh, have uh, their their students or if that teacher they should only ever have their students do a three point shot five times ever and that's the only time they should do it five times in phys ed class to learn how to do a three point shot everybody is immediately like well no obviously if you're learning a physical skill you have to do it a hundred times so I don't that's just something I, I was just picking up there that I've noticed that like we're it's just it's a, just an observation about society that we're very very opposed to intellectual practice boring intellectual practice but when it, it's very very accepted if it's a physical action 
I, just I agree with that. Helen. <laughs> Sorry, I just want to say I, I agree with Helen. Totally yeah. agree with Helen. And uh, that was, it had fallen out of favor because, you know, in education, we like to reinvent the wheel all the time. And uh, latest research, like if, if, you, if you look at like latest, like, you know, theory of education, rote's coming back. They don't call it rote. Now it's called multiple exposures, but it's coming back. So, yeah, that's true. Even if yeah. I love thinking in the youth sector, they're coming back to that too. Mm -hmm. Even when I was talking about word problems and I had these handouts that had like just little chunks of like two thirds of a number and the student would have to write, what would two thirds, you know, two thirds X and stuff like that. All these little exercises, sort of like the rote thing where it was just all these little chunks before doing the whole thing. So yeah, I, I totally agree with Helen and, and Joanna. Joanna, I'm so glad to hear that that's coming back. <laughs> Yeah, let's say because it always struck me as so odd. And I mean, I used to be when I was doing the old science program, I used to be very upfront with someone. We were doing the namings, and I'd be like, if you're an average student, and I've had hundreds at that point, I'm like, if you're an average student, you will need a hundred repetitions to get this. If you're a really smart student, you're going to need 30. And if you lost the genetic lottery, you're going to need 200. Here's 200 examples. <laughs> But, but don't you notice it's true the more they repeat something they're better at it yeah. like really i guess the the the, the balance between the yeah. discovery approach and the drill approach i mean somewhere we have to kind of strike the balance also because we understand when we use discovery approach of uh, the, the aha moments that we have even while solving a mathematical problem to say oh I figured that out. That was my aha moment. This was my proof and I reached to that conclusion. So I think keeping the aha moment alive for students, but at the same time, getting them to experience the same aha moment so many times that it becomes innate. So, yeah. That's where engagement, right? That's where engagement happens. Yeah, the magic recipe. Um. COVID aside, mm -hmm. we, we just in general with the gaps that we're trying to fill in for our students coming from various places, um, in the lower levels, we, we teach the 1101, but before the very first course that we start sort of um, touches upon some elementary math concepts or some of those preset courses, the P101 to the P104. We don't teach it all, but we take um, we take the material that serves as prerequisites to the 1101 and then the 2101 and 2102. So yeah, we, we kind of go back a little bit to the lower levels before we get started with the CCPP program. That's the only thing we're doing right now. But with DBE, we haven't, uh, whether it was COVID or COVID aside, um, we get right to business in our course codes. Teachers try to connect things to everyday life uh, scenarios. But other than that, we're not filling in those gaps with uh, review, any major review of any kind. Do, do you find your DBE students are, are having a harder time? Like uh, Sec 3, 4, 5? Like just out of curiosity? I don't know, anybody's teaching level 4 or 5? Yeah, Jessica or Margaret, go Margaret. Okay, I was just going to say that um, certainly I've had uh, students come in doing SEC four, you know, CST math that have did the, the course at the high school, you know, the previous year, and then they're coming in. So they've seen the curriculum, but they really are starting back to square one again. And, um, and, and it's, the fear, you know, the fear and the and the the negative sort of uh, uh, feelings towards math that we've already talked about that you have to get through first. But um, but yeah, where I'm thinking this should be review if you've already done the course in the high school uh, and and like 
having as much difficulty as they are, um, it, it makes me wonder, you know, what, what was covered at, at, the, uh, at the high school. I'm thinking it's the same curriculum, but uh, it's, it doesn't seem like I'm being told I, we didn't look at functions. And I'm like, how could you not have looked at functions? That doesn't make sense to me. And maybe they don't remember looking at functions, but um, um, yeah, so you have, you have then that um, extra, extra uh, struggle to, to, to overcome. So yeah, yeah you're not, even the ones that are coming in at SEC 4, they don't really feel like they're at a SEC 4 level. Okay. Yeah, Jessica, you want to add to that? Pretty much the same thing. I actually never assume people remember things. <laughs> I, I only teach SEC 4 and SEC 5. For SEC 5, I don't do it as often or for the science math, but for the cultural math, for sure, I review uh, all the way back from two number line at the very beginning, just to make sure the positive and negative are still clicking. And then the uh, order operation is still clicking. The variable is still clicking and, and go that. I do get uh, people a little mad at me because then math take a long time. Uh, uh, but I find that is more less intimidating for the students because then they're starting with something familiar with and I make sure that there's if there's any hole I fill it first before I move them on to functions. Yeah. Well, all these 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 great ideas, I mean, it takes a lot of time, right? But you know what? It, if you don't do it, <laughs> it's not gonna move forward faster anyways, right? Um, yeah, Sonia? Um, I just wanna ask, you were mentioning earlier that you guys are preparing something for numeracy or literacy that it's coming, what's, is it coming in the form of like a, a guide that the student has? and can um, use in every course? Is it coming in the form of a local course or? Well, to, to tell you the truth, the request was done, uh, we had to read, well, the request was done specifically for, for numeracy for pre-secondary. We were looking now at how we're gonna put it together. We, we thought of more like a more, um, that's why the CCBE program, if you notice at the age resource website is holding, uh, we're holding back. Not necessarily we don't wanna give it, but we wanted to, to present it more in term of topics. So it's accessible for all SEC fives. So let's say if you're say somebody in SEC five and has difficulty with fraction, he could go look their fraction and he'll have a whole chunk of videos uh, 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 handouts, uh, like a little mini, mini booklet kind of thing that they could say, okay, go and work on that and then come and see me. So yes, it's going to be like more in, in a format by topic versus a course, because we just want to make it accessible to all math levels. And it, it's something, it's something that we recognize is an issue. And, and uh, honestly, the fact that the more teachers I talk to and the more problem we start like discussing the issue it always comes back it seems to the basic notions of math that was never mastered so this is the issue so um we're, we're looking at formats that will kind of work for everybody because if we're gonna just like target one group or like one class code we're gonna miss everyone so by we're looking at formatting on how it'll, it'll help everyone at all levels. Yeah. Just to let you know, in terms of references, I know I heard you had math help services, some of you, and I know our famous SOFAD uh, uh, that is there, and of course, uh, homemade uh, recipes, like in terms of like banks and stuff. Uh, um, is there anything else you it's like your go-to that you would like to share with the, everybody here that you would recommend in terms of math. If any of you 
use the free math tutor. It's a, a math teacher from, I think he, I'm not sure which center he's from. I think his name is Doug Sims. He's on YouTube and he has um, the free math tutor. That's, Just, yeah. uh, I find he's, I find he, he's, his stuff is really for adult ed. He has some pretests there, no answer keys, but there are some pretests for the new courses as well. And um, I find I communicate with him and I asked him, do you mind if I use this with my students? And he said, no, go right ahead and everything. And uh, I, I like his style and his stuff. So he's got a website and then he's he got the YouTube videos and I find he's very good and very open to sharing. So that's something to check out if anybody is interested. He's, yeah, he's great. Uh, like the, he is an actual teacher in Quebec and that's one of the reasons why they're often, his videos are so nice because they really, they're, they're de facto our curriculum, right? Whereas like, I know, I, I, I mean, I love me some Khan Academy as much as the next person, right? But everyone's curriculum is a little bit different and, and, and different in scope and what needs to be presented and everything like that. So that's, I, I had flipped, Doug Sims had flipped my mind, but yeah, he's great. Is yeah. the D Doug Sims, is it all YouTube videos? Mostly as far as I'm aware, at least that's yeah, in everything, our center. If you go to his, if you Google the free math tutor, it's okay. all him. It's, it's him, but every single video is connected to, uh, is on YouTube then. So you can also go by topic. You can go on his, his website and then he has it by level and he has old and new program. You can find like 3051, three pretests, the topics with little short videos for each topic. It's not complete, complete, but he's got a lot there. And like some of the pretests, some of the questions, you know, you know, might not be everybody's cup of tea. So, but still like, it's great. Like overall, just, I find really well done. Yeah. So. Emily had put, uh, had put, uh, thanks Emily for putting the link in the, the chat, you guys, if you want, if you go to your chat, the chat is all there. And uh, she added a few other resources, if you would I like. I was going to mention one that she put there, the grade10math.com. I used that and um, I found it when I was tutoring in the youth sector. So it, it's basically developed around the curriculum for the SEC4 CST math. Um, but it's nice because there's like a workbook. There's also, um, you know, little quiz yourself links and notes, links for each topic. Um, and like when you quiz yourself, if you're having trouble with the question, you can click on the video and he does the question on the video for you, like, a, like with the document camera, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of nice. So the only thing is I, like, I couldn't see any way that like I could see the results on the quiz yourself but they and they can click on the video and get the answer anyway, but it's a nice way of just doing extra practice and whatever. And there's, the, uh, there's a video on each topic, but there's also notes on each topic. And then there's an extra workbook um, with solutions too. I, I thought it was really good. It, it's, it's okay for the topics that match the math CST, but it's the way it's organized looks like the U sector curriculum. So it might not be quite the same way our modules are organized, but if you look at the topic and you and you need an extra resource, it, it's quite nice. Mm -hmm. um, I know Helen had also put purple math. I saw that. Um, I would like to also add something, which is um, which I came across. I'm gonna stop the sharing for one moment. I'm kind of gonna kind of skip a bit. There you go. Just to show you, I wanted to show you this one. And it's a French resource, by the way. Okay. Uh, I will put the I'll put the information uh, straight in the uh, in the um, resource uh, section on the après cours. And what it is, is this is a very, very interesting resource. It's in French. It hasn't been translated yet. But what it is, what's really interesting about it is if you look at the author, and I have it over here, 
Um, one of them, his name is Martin Francoeur. Fran Martin Francoeur is one of the responsible for the minister exams. Uh, not, not responsible, but he kind of oversees the kind of the exams. So it, the way it was, it was its design, this handout, this, this little booklet, it's used as preparation for evaluations on the French side. So um, I really would recommend at least having it. <laughs> Translating it, I don't recommend you translating it uh, just for yourselves because, I mean, for copyright and purposes, but at least inspire yourself from it. It's, it's a very well done little, uh, little uh, practice book and from Edition Marie France. The thing is, they've been contacting me trying to get fun to translate it to English. And it's a project that will be hopefully in the making, you know. Uh, thank you, uh, Theresa. Yeah, that's it. You have it. Uh, you have it put. But I really recommend if you want to like inspire yourself on like how to review with your student preparation for evaluation. It's a very very interesting uh, interesting uh, resource. That's for that. Um, what do I want to also show you? I also want to share with you one last uh, one more thing. I had put together you also to based on um, a lot of demands. I put together. Uh, uh, hold on, let me just share my screen with you. Oh, if I could share my screen, I put together um, um, a progression of learning for the CCBE. Okay, so notice over here you have from literacy pre secondary secondary one. I took all of this because I know on the high school side. They have something like that. So what I did is I took the program and I placed it in concept, compulsory essential knowledge in previous courses and new compulsory. So, and that I've done it by uh, course code. So this is an unofficial version, like a homemade one, please. For, it's for your, use, uh, for your use, if you would like. So you could make concept maps from it. You could use it. This is something that I put together because there was a huge need in term of the CCBE, like in term of what they're supposed to know versus what they're going to do and the connection between the levels and the courses. So this is something that I'm gonna, I'm gonna make available to you. Also, let me just go back to my, da, 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 da. I could get to it. Yeah, so that's for that. And um, what else I wanted to show? Okay, and I also have also something that I will send to you. It's called the student evaluation criteria, which is also, I'm gonna stop my sharing, which is a checklist that every student should like look at when there's like they're like you're asking them for a question learning situation on how to answer the learning situation. So you'll have a checklist with all the criteria, C1, C2, C3 broken down, but through questioning. And also just to let you know, there'll be a library resource. So all the website that you shared, all the links that you shared will be there. And that'll be also uh, for you to access at any time. And of course, all these sessions are, are, are actually recorded. So later on, if you wanna come back and, and pick up some stuff that we have talked about, um, it'll, be, it'll be there for you. So that being said, um, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna leave you with one, Thing, which I thought is super cool. That's the geeky math in me, you know? So I wish you a super, super happy season, you know, of course. And uh, lots of love, lots of rest, lots of, I guess, uh, taking care of yourself. I know the, uh, the Christmas vacation is not here soon enough, but just to tell you, thank you. And uh, hopefully uh, this group is going to grow. I'm sure it's just a matter of, of time. Um, anyways, uh, do you have any questions? Is this, um, uh, please send me any comments you have. Um, uh, I, will, I will put all the information on the, on the, the, the agenda on the in the library. So um, if you have anything, please send me an email directly and I'll leave my, uh, my email for you. But anyway, I will send you a follow-up email to all your emails if you put them in. So nothing to do. That's it. So thank you very much. I apologize. Next time it'll be on the ball. It's just uh, today was very, very interesting. And I'm really, really happy to have you all. And a huge, huge thank to Lisha for being such a wonderful host of all of us. <laughs>